Welcome. This is the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin, Texas. My name is Luther Elmore. These affairs are held most Sundays here at our church, 4700 Grover Avenue in North Central Austin. And we invite you to come join us where you can ask uh, our presenters questions of your own. Well, most of these uh, affairs are uh, posted on our church website. That is austinuu.org. We sponsor these programs, and we have since 1954 when this church was first incorporated. And as far as we know, it is the longest continuously operating public affairs forum in the state of Texas. They're held to further the ends of this church, to nourish our minds, quicken our spirits, and propel us to social justice and social action. We're very happy today to have one of our longtime uh, members who serves on the uh, forum committee to introduce our speaker. And I'd like to introduce Ms. Bonnie Gardner. Bonnie. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for attending. Today, we're honored and, and thrilled to have State Representative Vicki Goodwin speaking. She is the new representative for Texas House District 47, which is in western and far south Travis County. She has been a small business owner and a real estate broker, and she graduated from University of Texas at Austin and then went on to the LBJ School of Public Affairs, where she earned a master's degree. She remained in Austin and raised her three children here. She's a longtime resident of Shady Hollow, and she's been very active in her community over many years, serving on homeowners association boards, various civic club boards, an AISD task force. And originally through this volunteer work, she became very inspired in becoming an advocate for public schools and, and in the Texas legislature. And also she worked uh, extensively with Impact Austin, which gave her insight into the need for various services in the community. Um, she worked with Habitat for Humanity as a volunteer in foundation communities, and this strengthened her determination to help those who are affected by in income inequality and who may slip through the cracks in terms of serv various services and support systems, for example, medical issues, student loans, or low-paying jobs. And now that she's in the State House, she is continuing to advocate for people of her district, the environment, a strong economy, and a sound budget. She's on the Urban Affairs and Homeland Public Safety Committees, and of course, she continues with her interest and expertise in uh, school system and school finance. So let's give Representative Vicki Goodman a warm welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you so much for that warm welcome. I really appreciate it. So my journey to serve in the Texas legislature started two years ago, or about two years ago. We had just had the elections of 2016. The shock was wearing off, and myself and many people, women and men like me, decided that we had to do something more to run for office. Um, my youngest child, my daughter, was graduating that May, and so that would free up some time to run for office. And uh, of course, that went well for me. And so now I am serving in the Texas legislature. Very happy to be there. And so today, I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about what it's like, the flavor of the legislature, to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's start off with the good. Before every session, the Comptroller gives his uh, review and upcoming budget revenue estimate. This time around, our, our budget's going to increase by 8%. Texas is a thriving state. We have a great economy, low unemployment. Things are going pretty well. So an 8% increase in our revenue, and the state budget this time is increasing by 6.5%. The reason I point that out is that that's just how things are going, our but we have budget needs, we're increasing, we're growing as a state, and the federal government hasn't said to you, Texas, you need to cap that at 2.5%. And yet, at, the state is doing just that to our counties and our cities. 
Uh, right now, we've got House Bill 2, which is, um, everybody is calling it a budget cap for our uh, muni municipal districts. Really, it's a trigger so that if those uh, cities and counties go over that percentage, it would trigger an election. Um, but nevertheless, it, it really does tie the hands of our local governments. And throughout the state, we have been hearing from our cities and counties saying that this just isn't a workable solution. We know that our property taxes are high and going up, but a big part of that is because of school finance. And as Bonnie said in her introduction, that is my passion, working with schools, making sure we invest properly in public education, making sure that we're paying our teachers well and taking care of our students. And that, that is so important, but that is what has been driving up our, our property taxes. And so we have a really great bill. Um, in addition to our budget, we have the school finance reform bill. That's gonna be putting a lot more money into our schools. Nine billion dollars above and beyond what we put in uh, last session. So that will allow for us to pay our teachers better. Um, it allows for full day pre-K for those students who qualify. It will allow for um, better compensatory education uh, payments. So it really does a lot of good things for our schools and I'm really excited about that bill. And I have to tell another, a funny story. Um, because I'm so excited about House Bill 3, and it's very different from Senate Bill, the one that they have come up for school funding, doesn't put as much money in, it has an across-the-board pay raise for teachers, which is great, but it doesn't include other staff in our schools. Um, it, it just doesn't do all the things that the House Bill does. So we were at a dinner with some fellow representatives the other night, and in walks a senator, I'm not as familiar, being a new member of the House, there's 149 other members that I've had to get to know over the last few months, and so I haven't made my way across the aisle to, over to the Senate to, to know who they all are just yet, I know some, uh, but Senator Taylor came walking in and up to our table and, and said hello to everybody there at the table, and they started talking about school finance, and I stood up and said to him, well, you and the Senate need to take our House bill and run with it not realizing that Senator Taylor is the chair of the public ed in the Senate. <laughs> I could tell from the expressions and the body language of the other representatives who have been around longer and know more than I that uh, perhaps I had overstepped my bounds. <laughs> However, I stick with what I said. I do think that the Senate needs to uh, put more money into public ed. It's just so important. And even the $9 billion still um, there's still some needs that are left out there, with our special ed in particular. Um, and a part of that, that amount is going to property tax reduction. So it's not all going to our schools. So the bills on the House side would reduce our property tax rate by four cents, on the Senate side by eight cents. And so that will give a little bit of property tax relief, more so in the Senate, but at the same time, that's taken away from our schools. So we'll, we have yet to see how things will work out between the Senate and the House. They'll go to conference committee, and from what I've heard, things get stripped out of the bills, similar to our budget. Um, so the budget bill was the longest debate on the House floor so far. We ended at midnight, and I've heard that in prior sessions it's gone till six in the morning or some crazy thing. But we had 300 amendments to it. And so every member says, you know, here are some things that I think would make this budget even better. I had a few amendments myself, uh, one of which, uh, and again, knowing as a freshman in the minority party, probably not going to get them passed, but it's to make a point in some cases. In one of those cases, one of my amendments was to add a little bit of money, and not add money, actually, just take some money that's currently in our budget and um, put some char electric vehicle charging stations on the Capitol grounds. Because although we have uh, a number of electric vehicle charging stations throughout the city, we don't have any right around the Capitol. So if you're coming from Waco or San Antonio or somewhere else nearby to testify, you could come, charge your car, and leave. Anyway, that uh, amendment, along with my other two amendments, got swept into Article 11, which is 
unfortunately, where uh, amendments tend to go to die. <laughs> but again, I, I was hoping to make a point with that. Uh, same thing on the school finance bill. I had a few amendments. Um, probably, again, as a freshman Democrat, won't get those passed or knew that I wouldn't, uh, but wanted to make some points about the bill. One of which is, while I think it's a great bill, I know that we're going to be addressing school finance in the future. If we don't have some way to keep the amount that we're putting towards the basic allotment increasing on a regular basis. So my amendment would have increased it by 1% or the rate of inflation on an annual basis so that we don't have politicians uh, in charge of that. Um, it didn't pass, but, but I'm hopeful, and I know that we will be addressing school finance again. One of the things that you learn as a freshman Democrat is there things that don't happen this time, you keep working on it, and next session you work on it and try to get it passed then. So some other good bills that um, we are working on. I have had two of my bills actually pass the House with unanimous votes, so I'm really excited about that. One is a requirement for our high school students to take at least one semester of personal financial literacy. So I think uh, in this day and age, with the student loan debt exceeding $1.5 trillion, I think it's so important for our young adults to understand budgeting, how to save money, how to um, maybe one day when they get in the workforce to ask for a higher salary so that they can make ends meet. One of my regrets on the budget bill was not asking for a higher pay raise for our employees who work with the elderly in the nursing homes and with our medically fragile kids. The people who are getting Medicaid reimbursements get paid just over $8 an hour. They were asking for a dollar an hour raise and they got a 10 cent raise. Terrible. When my office looked at it, giving a 50 cent an hour raise would have amounted to about $34 million. And they said, you know, that, that it's just not gonna happen, that you're not gonna get that passed. So I didn't try it. But again, I, I regret that I didn't at least put that amendment out there and say, this is something that we need to work towards. Even if it's not gonna happen, it's just a talking point to say, look, we're, we are underpaying them. I went to visit a couple of the nursing homes in my district, and they said that it's so hard to keep staff because they, people can get paid more to work in a fast food restaurant than to take care of people, and that's a very physical job, and it's a very emotional job. You put your soul into that job, and they can get paid more just going down the street to McDonald's. So um, I, I hope that next session that's something that we can really focus on it's a little bit unfortunate that in the legislature, we tend to have focus on one or two really big items and, and then other things get left behind. You know, when I talk about the raises for the teachers, yes, everybody's very excited, but then I'll have the state employees say, hey, what about us? We haven't had a pay raise in many years. So there's a lot of needs out there, and I know sometimes the concern is, well, how are we gonna pay for all of this? When people are making a living wage, then we're not having to support them with, say, Section 8 vouchers so that they can pay their rent. Um, so there's, there's a benefit to paying people a living wage. And so I, I, that's one of the things that I want to work towards. Um, on the bad, there are a number of things that haven't, uh, haven't been addressed or looked at, the minimum wage being one of them. I don't know, maybe 10 of us filed bills on increasing the minimum wage. We all have a different idea of, you know, do we do it gradually? Do we put it to the voters? So many of us uh, proposed legislation to increase the minimum wage in one way or another. Mine was a gradual increase, but getting up to $15 an hour in over four years. Um, it didn't get a hearing even. The committee that and there's one advantage to being a, a legislator who's been around a while. You get your bill filed sooner, and so it gets a hearing sooner. Mine, um, they had heard five different bills on increasing the minimum wage before my bill even got filed. And so um, they, that topic had already been covered. Um, and none of those bills had the votes to get out of committee. So it's very interesting. I, I've learned so much since getting into the legislature just about the process. And of course, next time around, I'll have a better insight into how to, how to work things. But even for those who are returning, I was having a 
discussion with the legislator the other day who said, well, in past sessions, it's worked different. Um, they didn't take bills in numerical order, that the order that they came into the office and send them out to committee, they actually would kind of pick and choose which ones went to committee first. But this session, Speaker Bonin decided to do it numerically. So those uh, bills that have lower numbers got to committee quicker, got a hearing quicker, and then got voted out of committee sooner. And that's what you want for your bill, is to have everything happen as soon as possible so it can make its way through. The process of getting a bill passed is very long, it has to go through a lot of hoops, and there's a lot of ways that a bill can die or get killed. So, um, so let's see, the other bad, um, a number of things just aren't going to get the hearings that I would hope for. Environmental issues, gun control, independent redistricting. So there's one gun control bill. It's not really gun control. It's just gun sensible legislation. Safe storage. So, and that bill was written by Representative Donna Howard, and it's something that I'm a huge advocate for. Storage, training, you know, I know in Texas, and we all know in Texas that we're going to have our guns, but with that comes responsibility and storing them safely, getting adequate training. The um, safe storage bill actually has support from all sides, from uh, campus carry group, you know, even supports safe storage. It just makes sense. There's too many instances where young kids or People who shouldn't have guns were able to get access to them because they weren't stored safely. Accidents happen, um, suicides. And so safe storage just makes sense, and yet that is one of the bills that's, having, that's struggling to get the momentum behind it to get passed. Independent redistricting is another um, issue that so many of us campaigned on. Gerrymandering is horrible, and, and we feel like we don't have um, the ability to vote in our Congress people in particular. And that gets handled in the next session. We will be, after the 2020 census, we'll be drawing new lines, and that will have a huge impact for the next decade. And so many of us feel like we need to take that process out of the hands of politicians and do something similar to like what the city of Austin did in setting up its independent redistricting committee. Again, Donna Howard had a wonderful bill it went to committee and is just languishing there. So unfortunately, there's not the, um, the will within that committee to have the independent redistricting. Um, so the ugly, so far, I really have been impressed by Speaker Bonin. He has, has uh, tried very hard to keep decorum on the House floor, to try to keep are the divisive issues from coming to the House floor. Um, certainly, we're not all going to agree on everything, but there haven't been any big fights or disputes on the House floor, except for one. And I'm not going to go into detail on the bill. I am going to say that it was a non-issue that um, was brought before the House mainly as an issue that could be used in the next election. And it was very apparent that it was something that people could use on a postcard to say, oh, those people in that party don't agree with certain thing. And it's really not an issue. And again, Representative Donna Howard got up in front, gave a speech and said, this is not, a, not an issue, and therefore I ask you to vote with me, present not voting. We call it white lighting, and it's kind of a protest vote. And so uh, most of the Democrats did white light that particular bill to say, this is really a non-issue, you're, you're wasting our time, we're not going to have a part of that, and we're white-lighting it. So that really has only happened on one bill. There have been a couple of funny situations where one bill, a great bill, that Representative Ortega put forth to let women know, uh, you know, we have this situation of a high rate of maternal mortality in Texas, and so her bill would have let women know that they could get access health care through the Texas Healthy Women program, it would simply notify them. Everybody was in agreement, we're going to pass the bill, but then on third reading, at the last minute, an amendment got added uh, that would have actually 
um, I guess, expanded Medicaid. It would have given those women who qualify the coverage without them having to fill out a lot of paperwork and jump through a lot of hoops. And so all of a sudden, all of the Republicans were against it, and the bill got voted down. However, um, we had a representative say, let's, let's reconsider it. And what happened, I have to back up a little bit, um, the amendment we could see wasn't going to pass. And that would have killed that bill, which essentially, at least we can get notification out to women that they can have the health care, even if we can't automatically sign them up. So the amendment was stripped. Uh, we took the vote on the bill, and the bill died because uh, many members weren't aware that the amendment had come off. And so it was reconsidered a couple of hours later, and then it passed with only one no vote. So there's a lot of things that happen on the House floor. I don't know if you've ever watched it and seen it's a little bit chaotic. It's a little bit like trying to herd cats, and sometimes things will happen and the members don't realize, such as that amendment being taken off. The members just weren't aware that that had happened, and so um, it's a very interesting process, like I said. So besides uh, being there on the House floor and being in committee, one of the things that I really enjoy is getting out into the district, having forums, and hearing what, the, what my constituents are saying, what they're needing, and, and just seeing and learning what's, what's in my district. So recently we had a forum in Onion Creek, for example. And Onion Creek, you may recall, was flooded in 2013 and 2015. And as a result of that, over 100 houses have been bought out. And so that tends to be their biggest issue. Um, so while uh, I'm certainly concerned about the issue and we've got some good bills that will address flooding and flood planning, it doesn't, uh, the bills that are there in the house are directed more towards communities that have, are lower income communities. Um, and that may have been devastated by Harvey, but they will also encourage the state to do more regional planning. You know, we, we tend to look in little, um, maybe the city or the county, but in the case of Onion Creek, it's affected by both Travis and Hayes County, so we can't rely on one geographic area. We need to have bigger regional planning, and so that's what House Bill 13 does, is it puts some money into the Texas Water Development Board to come up with better regional planning for flooding. And so going out to Onion Creek, um, I brought that issue up and addressed it with them and uh, also brought with me my city council, uh, Ann Kitchen from the city council and a couple of people from TechStop for transportation and flood and some people from the city for the flood issue. And so we had a great panel. Um, I've also been out to River Place and to Steiner Ranch. Transportation tends to be the big issue up there. If you've ever driven 620 and 2222, it's just uh, a, a lot of bad congestion and traffic up there. And so, again, working with TxDOT, there's not really any legislation to pass. It's just a matter of, of staying on them about what's getting done. You know, the Lakeway area on 620 is getting extra lanes added, and so further up, on the other side of Mansfield Dam, they're saying, hey, you're, you're working on that part, why aren't you working on our part? And TxDOT has answered, well, it's just such a big problem, and we have so many different entities. You've got the city of Cedar Park on one side of, of 620, you've got the city of Austin on the other side, you've got some parts of it that are county, you know, we, and then you've got the state involved. So there's all these different entities that have to come together and agree on the solution, and that's just not an easy thing. So my, my job is to make sure that they are all communicating and working well together. Another area also transportation related is up in Laga Vista. So the mayor of Laga Vista came to me early in the session and wanted me to uh, support some legislation allowing them to vote to get out of, of Cap Metro. They said, we don't feel like Cap Metro is serving us. And we, we have a bus, one bus route that takes us to, into um, Cedar Park, but that's not really what our citizens want. They want a more of a circulator within Laga Vista to get them from their house to the um, doctor or to the grocery store, um, something that gets them around just within the city. And I, I met with Cap Metro and I said, I'd like to hear your side. 
and uh, you know, Lagavista is feeling like they want to get out of the agreement. They had a vote in 2016. They can have another vote in 2021. They want legislation that would let them vote now. But, but tell me your point of view. And so, of course, Cap Metro says we, we don't ever want anyone to pull out. We need more. Um, so having any city pull out is detrimental. So I didn't file the legislation. And again, I said, look, the, the two of you, city manager and Cap Metro, need to work together to come up with a solution. Because in 2021, they have the right to vote regardless of legislation. And so if you haven't made any changes and the mayor is still feeling like you're not serving the community, you may not get the vote to um, have Laga Vista continue. Now, um, after they met, they, they did work on some alternative routes that might be more helpful up there. And they also said uh, Cedar Park is thinking about getting into Cap Metro, in which case it would be great because Laga Vista could work with Cedar Park and have some, some routes that got them to and from um, you know, Cedar Park where there's more shopping. And so I think just bringing them together and having them communicate and uh, work out some differences that they had is another part of my job as, as, a, as a leader for this district. Um, just yesterday, I got to do something fun going out to Shield Ranch, which is 6,800 acres of undeveloped land. It's absolutely beautiful, but it's, it's there. Um, they've gotten an easement, a conservation easement from the state, which allows the family to keep the land undeveloped, and which is helpful also in the flood and, and our water issues because it allows water to um, drain or go into the aquifer. It, it allows, helps with our flooding issue. And so it's important to have some of that open land. Um, and then after that. Uh, Douglas Bauer, um, and I'm one of your constituents. <laughs> uh, Republicans historically have always wanted political decisions to be made at the smallest possible uh, level, you know, city versus state, state versus national. And um, recently, there seems to be a push to start overruling Austin local politics at the state level. Um, could you comment, one, on uh, have you ever talked to any Republicans about this? Or, and I guess also, is um, the hypocrisy as obvious to them as it is to me? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So local, tr local control is something that comes up all the time in a lot of discussions. and I. I don't know, I just feel like they have to see the hypocrisy that goes on there saying that, uh, you know, we, they've wanted local control in the past, but now um, oftentimes, particularly with the uh, property tax cap that would take control out of, from our cities and counties in setting their budgets, which is the biggest priority of any governmental in, um, entity. So I'm on the Urban Affairs Committee, which happens to hear a lot of the local control issues. And the big issue of this session has been over short-term rentals. And every city has a different way of handling it. Every city has a different need. You know, if you go to Corpus Christi, their short-term rental environment is very different than Austin or Lake Travis or Arlington or wherever. Um, unfortunately, what we have seen happen over the last few years is investors have bought <coughs> big houses in nice neighborhoods, turning them into party houses for uh, bachelor and bachelorette parties for just really parties that don't belong in those particular neighborhoods. And it's become such an issue that we have, we had hundreds of emails come into our office about the need for the cities to be able to, con to make the rules regarding short-term rentals and not the state. Um, the rep the uh, chair of the Urban Affairs Committee had put forward a bill that she had hoped would kind of set a baseline, but the cities felt like it took away um, some of the rulemaking authority, and so that bill had Republican um, agreement, or, or rather disapproval, so that the bill didn't get out of committee. And. Um, Yes, we, we often have the conversation about local control is so important. Let's keep that in mind as we're looking at the tax cap and other bills. So, and, and I, think, I think Republicans understand that, but there's still this, uh, uh, well, we have a governor who doesn't like our cities because of who's in, in office in the cities.
Thank you very much. I've lived in five different states, so I have some comparisons. I can hold it, thank you. Um, but uh, Texas is kind of the crazy state I've ever lived in. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'll try to make it quick, but you, you mentioned something about focus on the things that are important, yet they allowed that Dan Patrick to focus on a bathroom bill that was not necessary for how long you tell me, and you only meet every other year, uh, but, uh, and guns. Well, we had some nice neighbors that left this area to move to Oregon because she taught in public schools, and this gun thing has gone too much. But my, for myself, this is my problem. My house taxes go up. It little beat up old house, no improvements, and my house taxes go up. You let these corporations come in here, and I think they pay little, if any, taxes. It's not fair the way you dis, uh, distribute the taxes or, or do the taxes. Uh, so that's my question. Uh, well, all right, let's just focus then, then on house taxes, why you don't allow the corporations to pay a little bit more when they come here to help with the lowly little old homeowners' taxes. Very good. Um, so yeah, I will, I'll try to address all of that. The, the bathroom bill didn't come back this session because of the elections in 2018. So yeah. <laughs> so um, I think uh, elections have consequences and that was a very positive thing this session. We didn't have any bathroom bills or, or uh, we do have some anti-LGBTQ legislation that is, um, coming up probably soon in the House, but it, I, I don't believe it has the votes to pass. So, and, it, and it, on the gun issue, I agree with you. I don't think our teachers should be defending their students. I don't think that's their job, and I think it's very unfortunate. Um, in some of the rural areas, they have the uh, Marshall Program and Guardian Program, and a bill that came up before the Homeland Security Committee that I'm on would have reduced the amount of training for marshals and guardians. And I said, absolutely not. I can't vote for that. And I think that bill died in committee. So um, I, we need to do more regarding gun control, um, but we're not there this session. And then as far as the taxes, I agree with you. We, we should um, have our corporations pay their fair share we should increase the franchise tax as opposed to increasing property or sales tax. But again, um, we have some legislators who've actually proposed legislation to do away with the franchise tax, and, and we, we don't have the votes to increase the franchise tax at this time. So that's one of those things that we'll continue to work on. I know there's a lot of exemptions that we need to take a look at. There's a lot of different options that we have for increasing revenue as opposed to raising the sales tax 1%. So that's, you know, I, I agree with you and hopefully we will continue that uh, discussion into the next session. I'm Hugh Nations. First, I'd like to thank you for bringing some common sense to our <laughs> Texas obsession with Thank guns. you. Uh, was there any discussion at all in the legislature about a 12-month school year this time around? About what? A 12-month school year. Oh, I don't think that came up, actually. Um, you know, I think there may be a school here and there that does year-round school, but for the most part, I haven't heard any momentum for that. So we're all extremely aware of the uh, divide in the country. Uh, I presume that in your position now, you're uh, are much closer exposure to the other side. And I'm wondering if you've gotten any insights with that closer exposure and what sort of opportunities exist and how to approach those opportunities in order to achieve more cooperation and um, so yeah, I've certainly had a lot of discussions with Republicans, you know, and it, it's, it's taking small steps in the right direction, having conversations with them. Sometimes you can win a small argument and, and make some progress on something.
For example, with the short-term rental, um, the representative who sits next to me on that committee would have normally voted in favor of the chair's bill because being Republicans, they support one another. But when she heard the testimony coming in and people saying we need our cities to keep their control and, and be able to set their own regulations, she um, sided with the Democrats on that committee in, in essentially stopping the bill and, and allowing local control. Um, you know, I, on the gun legislation, we actually had several represent, uh, Republican representatives vote for the safe storage bill, which I don't know if they would have in past sessions. Um, so, you know, you just keep having the conversations, providing the data, and saying this is what makes sense, and eventually we'll, we'll get there. <clears throat> Somewhat, but every once in a while you see the brick wall. Thank you for being here, uh, Vicki. Um, the environment is one of my critical issues. I know the state is not dealing with it, but uh, air quality is a huge problem, and it's not just for the environment. It's health care costs that are directly related to these externalities that are being caused by our massive use of fossil fuels. And now San Antonio is on the verge of becoming non-attainment, which will be a huge cost to the, the city. Um, has it come across to the opposition to this that not only uh, are hurricanes expensive, uh, tornadoes and, and wildfires are expensive, they're costing the state billions of dollars? Has any of this ever uh, do, have any lights gone on on the op opposition party that uh, maybe we'd like to keep the state alive in the next uh, few generations? Uh, as long as you don't say climate change, then some lights have gone on. <laughs> in fact, there was a bill, I believe Aaron Zwiener filed, uh, just allowing state employees to say or write climate change, which is just crazy. TCEQ could do a whole lot better um, I, I was really disappointed to have been, well, I was on the co uh, committee that heard the testimony in relationship to Deer Park fires, and TCEQ has not done a very good job of overseeing the, the polluters in our state, and they I heard just the other day that they call them their, um, not constituents, but their customers. And so I think the relationship between TCEQ and the the chemical plants and things like that is not uh, where it ought to be. They should be overseeing and, and penalizing and making them come into compliance, and we still have a ways to go with that. And they want to dump uh, fracked wastewater into our creeks and streams now. Yeah, so we've had uh, some good bills, again, that just aren't getting the traction that they need, but I, I think I, I see in the future that we might get more traction next session. Well, and the, the other interesting thing is that um, the, the concrete plants have now had, we had some people come to a meeting that we had last week about Safer 71, and uh, talking about the big trucks that carry the cement to and from the, the plants and dropping it, and the little tiny fragments that you can't even see get into your lungs. And so that's something that I hadn't thought of before is air pollution, just the concrete plants and the quarries. And so that's been coming up more and more in discussions from the safety issue to the health issue. Thanks for coming. My name's Joanne Richards. Um, two questions that have to do with um, the fact that the session is going to be ending fairly soon. Um, and so therefore there are some big omnibus bills that should pass and there are some that should die. Uh, and the two that should pass are two that you've talked about already in that school finance uh, and property tax reform. And I'm curious whether you have heard anything about whether there would be a special session. If those don't pass, that's one. The other is uh, Senate Bill 9, uh, which has to do with making criminal offenses out of election reform issues that should die. Uh, and so I'm hoping that that calendar will last as long. But I'd like your comment. 
Sure. So uh, there, there's been this threat of a special session if we don't pass property tax reform. And I think that we do have a challenge with getting it passed because the House and the Senate have very different views. And I just don't know how we're going to come together on, on Senate Bill 2, House Bill 2, the property tax cap. Um, we're taking that up this Tuesday. So watch and see how things go. Um, and the sales tax increase is another thing that I think if it doesn't pass and the governor doesn't like what he's seen, we, we could have a special session. I've had some of the legislators who've been in office a little bit longer than me say that they, they think it's very likely we will have a special session. Um, and on, what, I'm sorry, what was your second? Oh, Senate Bill 9. So I've gotten a lot of emails about that and there's, I, I don't think there's the votes to pass that in the House. You know, it's an anti-voter bill, essentially. And I think that the House will kill it, but that remains to be, that's just. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I, I, um, I kind of was surprised that it passed the Senate, but um, I don't think there's the will to pass it in the House. With the pending end of the session coming, uh, is there anything uh, that you expect as a, or, or fear as a last minute surprise uh, as an amendment or anything like that, that uh, under the table everybody's talking about? Um, I don't know, you know, that's the thing about the last minute surprises, people try to keep it under, under wraps until the last minute. <laughs> There's, I, but I was warned by one of the, uh, by Representative Thompson, Symphonia Thompson, who's been around, I think, longer than anyone except for Representative Craddock. Um, she said, now is the time to really pay attention because now is the time, this last month of session, when people do try to slip things in. And, and that kind of goes to whenever we're on third reading, the final time when we're voting a bill on a bill, um, people get real nervous if you throw an amendment on at that point in time. <laughs> and you can just feel the tension in the air if there's an amendment at third reading because they're like, What's, what are you trying to pull over on us? But uh, yeah, definitely we're, this, my staff knows to be paying special attention to everything that's happening this last month, last minute things. Um, things get a little crazy as we have another few thousand bills to come through and it, the, the pace gets really quick and so we'll be on our toes. Thank you for being here and taking the energy to stand up and be a representative of the people. I want to follow up on a bill that Mr. Bula mentioned, which was uh, Senate Bill 1585, I think. That's the bill that would allow um, the um, oil and gas industry to dump their fracking waste into our creeks and streams. And also um, the bill, um, thir uh, House Bill 3557 and Senate Bill 1993, which I think would allow uh, the, the state to criminalize people protesting. Uh, can you talk about those two bills and uh, if you know their status and whether or not you think they'll have the support to pass? Um, unfortunately, I have not followed those bills as closely. I have heard. I don't think that there is the will to pass them in the House, um, but I'm not exactly sh I need to do some more research to really give you a good answer. I'm certainly against both of those, and I think it's terrible to criminalize people who are protesting. That's a First Amendment right. And so I don't think that that one will pass. Um, the other one I don't think either, but th those are, that's just my personal opinion and what I've been hearing. I tend to be surrounded by those who think like me. So sometimes when I feel like, yeah, we have the, impetus, we have the momentum to kill this bill, you know, I'm, we're still in the minority. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look, take a look at them and, and see. Thank you so much for coming and talking with us today, Absolutely. Vicki. Uh, I have concern about a public health issue, and that is the issue of vaccinations. And I'm wondering if there's any effort to reduce exemptions for uh, avoiding vaccination and and I would think that the perhaps discussion of costs of not vaccinating in terms of 
health care dollars, treatment, and the creation of unnecessary disabilities might even lead the insurance industry to push for um, ensuring that all children are vaccinated. Do you have any inside information on that? So I can tell you we have had a lot of people coming and walking the halls. The, the anti-vaxxers group has really stormed the Capitol, particularly early on, and to the point where uh, Representative Erin Sweener, who brought her baby with her to the Capitol, was very concerned about them coming into her office and I think at one point posted a notice on her door saying, if, if your children aren't vaccinated, please don't come in my office. Um, because her baby was too young to have the vaccine, uh, vac vaccine at that point in time. And so there's a lot of concern of we've all been watching the news in other states, the number of measles cases, the outbreaks. But I, I don't know that there's any legislation that would um, eliminate or reduce the number of exemptions right now. I think that will be something that comes up next session. There, we were able to um, not have the anti-vaxxers bill come up and get that passed. So at least we, we kept a bad bill from happening. We just need now to work on a, a good bill to reduce the exemptions. Uh, another question. <laughs> uh, you live in Shady Hollow. I live in the south end of Circle C. And there's, you talked earlier about traffic. So I want to bring this traffic up issue up again. Uh, there's a lot of construction going on right now in terms of the um, overpass to avoid the slaughter and the lacrosse uh, interchanges, and there's the 45 extension. Uh, my concern is that, yeah, those are nice, but it just moves where the traffic jam becomes. Um, I, I work downtown, and so, yeah, it's nice to zip past uh, slaughter, but then I just get in line a little further down, and I'm sure you're going to run into the same problem. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about any uh, thoughts, attempts to improve the traffic situation from South Austin? So I know there's going to be, at some point in time, extra lanes on Mopac. They did them north uh, from downtown to, you know, they did the managed lanes, and then managed lanes and toll roads became very unpopular. And so I think that's part of the reason that we haven't seen a start on the lanes south of town. Um, but I do think that they will come. It's just that they're, they've been delayed. And so, um, you know, I, I wish we could get more people to use mass transit. We, we still see so many people, one, one person, one car, and we just don't have the mass transit. But whenever I hear City Council member Ann Kitchen talk about the plans, there's uh, some plans to do a lot more with mass and micro transit, so hopefully that will come to fruition. And at the same time, hopefully we'll get the maybe some managed lanes on southbound uh, Mopac. Vicki, with your concern about finance for public education, is there any discussion about the money that is uh, being taken uh, from the taxpayers for the charter schools and those uh, for-profit schools? So uh, that certainly comes up in discussion with some of our members, but we, um, it, it's interesting because depending on who you talk to, one side says that charter schools are getting more dollars per student. Charter schools say, no, we're getting fewer dollars per student. And, um, and, and it's a tough battle because essentially charter schools are public schools. It's just that the funding, if, if we were funding our public schools well, I don't think we would have the clash. And I think charter schools have gotten, uh, grown much more exponentially than we had ever intended. So what I have heard is it's an attempt to keep that growth in check. Um, but we still have a lot of charter proponents. And so there hasn't been a lot of move to make significant changes. In fact, uh, Representative Huberty, who's the chair of public ed, um, is in favor of charter schools. So as long as he's the chair of public ed, you're not going to have uh, much change. Uh, Dale Bula, again, uh, we have a secretary of state that has been um, put in his place, let's say. <laughs> is there still uh, talk of him being approved uh, by, I guess the Senate would have to approve him, but I, as far as I know, that hasn't happened yet. Are, 
Are they looking for someone else, or are they going to still follow the same, uh, the same path of having a Secretary of State that violates the Constitution? So I haven't heard anything new lately. The Senate is um, in charge of that, and it's one of those things maybe they're trying to let things die down, and then at the last minute they might try to sneak in an approval. I don't know. It's, uh, the Senate handles that, and so I'm just not aware, unfortunately. Sorry. Uh, I think we're about out of time. I thought we'd end on a little bit lighter note. Since you're new down there, I'm wondering if you found uh, the Capitol a little crazier than you expected. And if you did, I have a scientific explanation. <laughs> the pink granite that the Capitol is built out of, turns out it's radioactive. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a little crazier up there than I had expected. There's so, I, I'm just, I have been amazed since the beginning of session at how many people come into the Capitol, how many people come into each of the representatives' office on a, on a daily basis. There's uh, more, more people who come in, call, and email, and send letters than I had, had imagined. So it, it's a lot. <laughs> but I'm glad there's an explanation why there's, there's some craziness. <laughs> Scientific. <laughs> Thank we're, you. We're probably not going to change the granite at the Capitol in the foreseeable future. Uh, here, this, in your, this year, first session, kind of um, perhaps in summation, what has been your greatest joy and your greatest uh, frustration here in your first term? I would say the greatest joy is getting to know 149 other people, most of whom I really like, have gotten to know and like over the past few months. Um, just this past week, it's funny, we have to do a few things in the legislature to, to uh, be a little lighthearted. And so apparently it's a tradition, which nobody sent me the memo on it, about wearing seersucker on the day after Easter. And many seersucker suits are light and pastel. And, and so these men and women were, uh, about a dozen of them, wore their seersucker suits on Tuesday. If you have a chance to look at, at um, online social media or in the newspaper, the picture of them, they look like Easter eggs. It was hysterical. So I've just really enjoyed getting to know the people there. You know, most of them are really great people, even though we don't always agree on issues. You know, I sit next to someone on Homeland Security who, when he heard my story about guns and, and the fact that I don't really care for guns, he said, well, don't worry, I've got two on me and I can protect you. <laughs> But we still have some good conversations. You know, you have to try to find some common ground and find some things that you can talk about. And, and we've been able to do that, knowing that we have some pretty major differences of, of opinion and ideology. But I've really enjoyed getting to know the people there in the Capitol. Well, Representative Goodwin, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for representing us in the legislature. And we look forward to your continuing work. Thank you very much. Thank you. She says that we tell ourselves stories in order to live. We tell ourselves stories in order to impose a narrative on the shifting phantasmagoria of the things that happen to us. We take the option that makes the most sense, the most workable option, she says, at the time. And that's been my experience. I remember um, an incident, or mm, I'll just say, a compilation of incidents when I was working downtown my senior year of high school in Philadelphia. I was working at a legal clinic, free legal clinic, and um, the construction workers would yell things to me when I was walking by them on the street. And uh, I, um, there were things they yelled that I did not understand even though I had taken the equivalent of owl, still their imaginations were uh, greater than mine at the time. And they did things with their tongues and their fingers that I didn't really understand either. I was like, what in the world? And, and what, what woman does that work on? And <laughs> or they would tell you to smile and if you didn't, they would flip you off. So it just went from, hey baby, to ah really fast. 
And one day I was just up, so upset that I ran to my dad's office. He worked in Philadelphia at the time in town. And I ran, I burst through the door of his office at um, WCAU TV 10 in Philadelphia. And I just said, I, this is terrible. These men are yelling things at me and I don't know what to do. And he said, well, you dress to be looked at. And I just thought, oh, oh. I, I imposed a narrative, it's my fault. And as I had that discussion with him in, in my head over the next 10 years, I realized, yeah, I do dress to be looked at, but I don't dress to be looked at by those guys. I dress to be looked at by the, by the guy I'm going to meet right now for lunch. I dress to be looked at by people I know, people who love me, not strangers on the street that don't know my birthday or my favorite color or my favorite song or anything about me. I, and, and what am I supposed to do? Like wear something different on the street and then change clothes when I get inside? Should I maybe get a burqa? That would be, that was tempting for a while. Or armor, heavier than a burqa, but more badass. <laughs> so it was very confusing to me. And I talked to the women at the free legal clinic about it. These were early 70s feminists. These women uh, yelled at me for wearing perfume. They yelled at me for shaving my legs. <laughs> and they, they were trying to train me up to be a good feminist in, their, in that way that they, that they pictured it at the time. Anyway, I said, so what do I do when guys do this? Oh, and they said, oh, that's easy. Um, you stick your finger up your nose and that'll take you right out of their fantasy. It worked. <laughs> they yelled other things, but I could understand those things. 